Hey, what's up YouTube? I'm Guy, and today on the channel we are doing a comparison video. Of course, if you even bothered to read the title, then you're already aware. We are comparing the Rolex Submariner to the Tudor Black Bay Heritage 41mm dive watch. Before we get rolling with the review and comparison video, let me take a moment to send out a big thank you and shout out to somebody that loaned me this watch. I have a viewer and fellow moderator of the Horology 101 Facebook group that agreed to loan me this watch. He sent it over to me. I've had it here for probably too long. I apologize if I've been keeping it for too long, but sit tight. It will be sent back to you shortly. Uh, nevertheless, a big, big thank you to him for sending this watch over. And let me tell you guys that if you are not already a member of the Horology 101 Facebook group, you should go over there and join. I'll have a link down below in the description if you're interested in checking it out. It's a great group of guys. We have a lot of cool watch discussions going on over there. So the Tudor Black Bay Heritage that we have here today is the pre-2016 revision, meaning that in 2016 at Baselworld, Tudor didn't reissue, but certainly revised this watch and updated it. I have the older version here. Some would probably say, and I think I would agree, the more desirable version. I'll cover in a little bit more detail what all of the differences are so that we're comparing apples to apples. But nevertheless, I did want to let you guys know. This is the older ETA version of the Tudor Black Bay Heritage, an awesome watch, and again, probably the more desirable one if you ask a lot of people. Now, of course, we have my Rolex Submariner here, the 116610LN, the current generation ceramic Submariner with the super case and the maxi dial. This is, of course, a sub date. Now, it would probably be better if we had a no date Submariner because the Tudor Black Bay doesn't have a date, but it is what I have, so we'll just kind of pretend it's not there. For all intents and purposes, that's the only difference, and it's not that big of a deal. All right, guys, so here we have it, the Rolex 116610LN on the left, and of course the Tudor Heritage Black Bay 41mm diver on the right. Now, before we go into the actual comparison of these two watches, I do want to point out that this is the older version of the Tudor, and I'd like to talk briefly about the differences between this older version and the more modern Tudor. So this version of the Tudor Black Bay, 79220, is like I said, the older reference number. This version was released by Tudor in 2012. I think technically the burgundy bezel or red bezel version with the gilt or gold dial and handset was the very first one. Uh, but this one came shortly thereafter, for all intents and purposes. That's what we're talking about, this generation of watch. This differs from the version that was released by Tudor at the 2016 Basel World Watch Fair. The newest version has almost the same reference number. Instead of being 79 to 20, like this one, the new version is 79 to 30. And there was a handful of changes or modifications with that new, uh, rein not reinterpretation, but uh, uh, revision, I guess, for lack of a better word. In the 2016 revision, what did we get? Well, the watch that you have here before you today is the ETA 2824-2 version. That's to say that the movement in this watch is a standard ETA 2824. Now, I don't think it's actually a standard. I think it's probably a top grade movement, but it's not a chronometer certified ETA. In the new version for 2016, we got an in-house manufactured MT5602. <laughs> There was a lot of nice little updates in the movement for that watch. Uh, first of all, it is a COSC certified chronometer. It has a 70 hour power reserve. As mentioned, it's a fully in-house movement. It uses a silicone balance spring, which is going to be very anti-magnetic. It has a full balance bridge, which will let it be more resistant to shock. And it has a new updated balance wheel as well, at least in comparison to what you would get in an ETA movement. Now, don't get me wrong. ETA movements are good, solid, dependable workhorse movements. Everybody knows that. But when you compare apples to oranges, as they would technically be, the new movement, at least on paper, seems a whole heck of a lot better. Aside from that big change over in the movement, which is the most significant difference, there's a few other differences between 
this 2012 version and the newer 2016 version. The 2012 version's dial is actually a little bit different. You can see that on this dial we have the Tudor logo up at the 12 o'clock side with the rose. In the new version you have a shield logo. The text at the bottom is also different. This has that kind of happy smiley face self-winding inscription down at the bottom. Whereas on the new one, uh, the, yeah, the inscription is just a little bit different. The final big difference between this version and the newer version is probably going to be the bracelet. And I got to be honest with you, I prefer this bracelet quite a bit. This is just a standard oyster style bracelet, of course, in 22 millimeter width. But on the new version, if you've ever seen pictures of it, and maybe I'll be able to find a picture and roll it in, there are faux rivets along the sides of the end links on that bracelet. They both have what I believe to be the same nice Tudor clasp, but you just get this uh, style and aesthetic change with that new bracelet. Again, being faux rivets. So, that's another reason why I think that this uh, older version might be the, the the best buy of the bunch, if I'm, you know, giving my opinion a little bit early. Another thing that's different is the overall thickness. On this watch here, the thickness is about uh, just over 12 and a half millimeters. On the new 2016 model for the Tudor Black Bay, the thickness is going to come in at over 14 and a half, I think 14.8 millimeters, so over 2 millimeters thicker on the new Tudor Black Bay Heritage. So that's all the differences between the current Tudor that I have on the table here and the new Tudor. I will probably mention it a few times in this review, but I think that, um, in my opinion, the older Tudor is the one to have. Uh, yeah, the new movement in the, the new 2016 model is appealing, but that's the only thing about it that's better, in my opinion. And a lot of the stylistic things about this older version are significantly more appealing than having that, uh, yeah, a little bit better of an in-house movement. So what we're talking about today is the Rolex versus the Tudor. Now that we have all of that background information about this model Tudor versus the more recent model. And the reason that I bring it up is because, for example, one of the first things that we might talk about in uh, differentiating these two watches is the movements. And I might want to reference and say that, yeah, this ETA movement is not nearly as good as the Rolex 3130 or 3135 movement. However... In the new Tudor Black Bay, that in-house movement is a whole heck of a lot closer. That's why I wanted to establish those uh, parameters, uh, that there is a little bit of a difference. And we're going to have to kind of reference uh, the new Tudor, Tudor versus this current Tudor from time to time. First things I do want to talk about, though. Price point. The Rolex Submariner date, 8550 US dollars. The Rolex Mariner No Date, which would be a better direct comparison, $7,500. So you're looking at $7,500 to $8,500, depending on which Submariner you may want to buy. On the other hand, the Tudor Black Bay Heritage, at least the one on the bracelet, is $3,675. That's less than half the price of the No Date Submariner, and significantly more than less than half of the Date Submariner. That is our first major difference between these two watches. Forget about everything else. You're going to save a whole heck of a lot of money if you go with the Tudor Black Bay. Money notwithstanding, because for some people money doesn't matter. You know, how would you pick which one you want to go with? Well, first things first, let's talk about the overall dimensions of these watches. The Rolex, of course, has a 40mm case diameter, not including the crown and crown guards, whereas the Tudor has a 41mm case diameter. And there are no crown guards on the Tudor. However, if you look at them from the front like this, I think that the Tudor looks significantly larger than the Rolex, despite the fact that there's only one millimeter in difference in overall case diameter. Well, why is that? Number two, because of the lug width, 20 millimeters on the Rolex, 22 millimeters on the Tudor. A lot of people are probably going to say, oh, but the lugs are so much more thinly profiled and uh, they, they just look better than the, the fat, chunky lugs on the Rolex. Well, well, we'll touch on that, I'm sure, here in a minute. But because of the 22 millimeter wide bracelet, again, this watch feels much bigger. Uh, next dimension, the thickness. Ironically, if we look at these watches in profile, which one do you think looks thicker? To me, in person anyway, I don't know how well it'll play on camera, the Tudor, this top watch, looks substantially thicker than the Rolex. 
but in fact it is uh, only 12 and a half millimeters thick versus almost 13 millimeters on the Rolex. The Rolex is thicker because of that case protruding out of the bottom, whereas on the Tudor it's a very flat case back. However, on the new version of the Tudor Black Bay, that watch is much thicker at 14.8 millimeters, two millimeters thicker than this older version, and almost two millimeters thicker than the Rolex. Now this Tudor presents so insanely thick in person because it's very slab-sided. You can see that the sides of the case, because of that flat case back, it's just all sides. And yeah, the best way to describe it is slab-sided. The Rolex just feels a little bit more low profile because it's not so slab-sided. We'll probably touch on that a little bit more here too, but there's one final dimension that I want to talk about, and that is lug to lug from one side of the case to the other, from lug tip to lug tip. 50 millimeters on the Tudor, and on the Rolex from tip to tip, 48 millimeters. So the Rolex is overall smaller in diameter, smaller in lug to lug, and smaller in lug width, just slightly thicker. This Tudor does present quite a bit bigger because of all of those dimensions stacking up. Now let's talk about these cases and in particular, let's talk about the lug width, because that's a hugely contentious point for people when it comes to the Rolex discussion. Uh, the Rolex Supercase has these big, thick, wide lugs, and the Tudor's lugs are, are much more narrow, and uh, maybe some people would prefer that. Uh, n not me, not personally, I don't. I think that just because of the width of the bracelet, uh, where the bracelet attaches, or the lug width, you're not really like getting, you're not, it's not paying dividends that these, that these lugs are more tapered and profiled. It's still just a big, big chunky kind of clunky presentation. So you could say that the, and a lot of people do say that the Rolex is chunky and, uh, you know, there's too much shoulder. I mean, I, I get not that exact same feeling cause it's not like shoulder, but it is still chunky. It's just different. The chunk is in a different spot. You know what I mean? It's in the middle instead of out on the edges. This is more out on the edge. Which do I prefer? I, mean, I prefer the Rolex, honestly, because it wears more comfortably on the on the wrist with the 20 millimeter um, 20 millimeter bracelet. What about case finishing? Well, the finishing on the Rolex, in terms of the brushing, significantly better, more finely brushed. The uh, the Tudor's brushing, don't get me wrong, it's not bad, but. It's just not quite there. As far as the polishing, I can't really tell a whole heck of a lot in terms of difference. The polishing is high quality on both of these watches, but where the Rolex really does pull ahead in terms of finishing of the case and the bracelet is on that brushing. Uh, very few companies seem to do brushing quite as nicely as Rolex does. If we look at the edges or the lines of the case, the Tudor has sort of a chamfered edge going along that edge there, and, and the Rolex is very crisp, very clean, very deliberate. This is just going to be personal taste, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know that I... Th I think that I like the, the presentation of the nice, crisp, sharp lines of the Rolex case more than the sort of beveled soft edges on the Tudor's case. Now, maybe it's that the beveling is just honestly not done all that well. I mean, I've seen watches with better edge beveling, if I'm being perfectly honest. The transition between the polish and the, and, and the brushing, where that bevel is, it's not flawless or perfect, super, super crisp and outstanding on the Tudor. It's not bad, don't get me wrong, but we're talking about a 3600 almost $3,700 watch. I would expect it to be a little bit better. Now, on the Rolex, again, we don't really have that at all, but, you know, I think that's for the, for the best, because if it's not going to be, you know, perfect, if it's not going to be awesome, if you're not going to have really crisp, clean bevels or chamfered edges with a nice delineation between the polishing and the brushing, then don't bother. And maybe that's what they decided. Maybe they said, you know, it's not worth the time and effort. This is better. I think it is better, at least in this case. Obviously, the Rolex's case has crown guards, and the Tudor's case does not, which 
is better. I mean, I guess that's just personal taste. In terms of actual functionality, I mean, I guess it's good that the crown is protected by something, by metal, in the case of the Rolex. Uh, so less chance of causing harm or damage to your crown. But overall, for the vast majority of us, I don't think it really matters. I, I, you know, we're not smashing around our watches the way that people used to when they actually scuba dived with these things. So the crowns on these two watches are pretty significantly different. The Rolex is maybe a little smaller, at least in some regards. Uh, but the big point of contention, obviously the crown guards on the Rolex are a point of contention for people, but for other people, a point of contention on the Tudor is this anodized aluminum step off or, or I don't know, insert, whatever you want to call it. Between the case and the crown, there's that little ring there. I can tell you that this is now the second Tudor that I've reviewed and spent a lot of time with and both had this little uh, insert aluminum uh, segment. It's really not a big deal. In pictures, it does look big, but in person, you hardly notice it. So anyone that's like complaining about that, I have to sort of suspect that either it's kind of all in their head or they just haven't spent a lot of time with these watches because it's really, a, I mean, yeah, you can see it, it's noticeable, but it's it's only when it's blowed up in pictures or on video on your screen that it seems like it's too much in person. It's tiny, like at, at wrist length away, you, you barely notice it. Now the crown itself, this one's signed with the, the, the nice Tudor Rose logo. Uh, great knurling on the edge, kind of a coin edge knurling pattern. Very easy to operate. Uh, hand winding, you know, this is an ETA of course, but fabulous. Uh, reseating the crown, downward pressure, no problems whatsoever. On the Rolex, I mean, it's also outstanding, maybe even more so. Better threading, in my opinion, unscrewing it and rescrewing it in just feels perfect. Hand winding the movement is, you know, awesome as well. The texturing on the edge of the Rolex crown, it's, it's fabulous. There's really nothing to complain about the functionality of either of the crowns on these watches. They're both done. I mean, as good as could be. Flawless. How about that? Quite a big difference in the bezels on these watches, and I think that Rolex's bezel is honestly very much better in a lot of ways. The Tudor's bezel is an aluminum insert with uh, printed or painted on markers and graduations, whereas on the Rolex we have this quote-unquote serochrome is effectively uh, ceramic, and the Markers and graduations are engraved in and filled with, I guess, platinum or something. I don't exactly know how the process works, but they could say it's platinum filled, whatever, you know, that actually means. Who knows? Uh, but nevertheless, when we are talking about the functionality, uh, Rolex's bezels are awesome. There's just beautiful, perfect detents. Once it clicks into position, hardly any back play. Uh, this is probably one of the most satisfying bezels to use on the market, hands down. I don't think I've ever seen another watch with better bezel action. And that includes the knurling on the edge. The edge of the Rolex bezel has got such good grip texture. It's aggressive enough that you feel it bite into your fingers when you touch it, but not so aggressive as to cause discomfort. It is absolutely outstanding. On the other hand, the bezel on the Tudor, first of all, is only a 60 click. So instead of having 10 clicks per five minute interval, you have one, two, three, four, five. The clicks, their detents themselves, they're quite good. Uh, it feels solid, it feels um, pleasant. I, I, I would say that it's kind of similar to the feeling of the Rolex, but maybe a little bit more stiff, and of course certainly a whole heck of a lot less because it's only 60 clicks. Something that I don't like about it, this is a very low riding bezel, and the edge is like a very fine coin edge. Now when I'm interfacing with this bezel, I'm not so much working with the edge of the bezel as I am the top. Yeah, I'm catching the edge a little bit, because, but because it's such a slim, low-profile bezel, most of my finger pressure is on the face of the bezel, and that's what I'm spinning. Again, I am catching the edge of the bezel, at least the top edge of the bezel with my thumb and forefinger a little bit, but it's not like on the Rolex, where I am physically working the sides of that bezel. Not, not so on, on this Tudor. It still works, 
I, I mean, I suppose if you were wet, maybe that would be a bit of a problem because you're interfacing with this sort of slick bezel insert. It's just not as good. That's the bottom line. The crystals on these watches, it's kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other. The Rolex crystal is a very flat crystal, whereas the Tudor crystal is kind of like a domed crystal. Both sapphire, neither one have any anti-reflective coating, and the glare definitely shows when you're panning and zooming around. You can see my camera there in the Tudor. If I move the Rolex around, there's the camera. Kind of funny, and <laughs> if we look at the Rolex crystal, you see my camera lens there, it looks almost as big as my entire dial of the watch. But now it's like the, you see the whole camera there, you see the viewfinder, the, the lens is much smaller. It's kind of funny, it's like the, uh, the Rolex crystal magnifies the, the reflection more than the Tudor. That might be a good thing in that the reflection is somewhat distorted and you're less likely to focus on the reflection and more likely to look past it to read the face of the Rolex. Whereas you can so clearly see with detail the reflection in the Tudor that maybe you're more likely to get distracted by it. Other than that, yeah, you got the domed sapphire, you got the flat sapphire, uh, no AR coating, which sucks. Uh, six of one, half a dozen of the other. That's basically what you got there. What about the dials and handsets of these two watches? Well, the Rolex dial, if you care, is uh, white gold markers, white gold handset, and of course the Tudor is just going to be stainless steel. Does that matter? Is that worth extra money? I don't know. I guess it depends on who you ask. I mean, white gold is more valuable than stainless steel. Theoretically, it should uh, not tarnish over time as easily. It should be, you know, higher quality, longer term. Uh, other than that, uh, the dials are honestly pretty similar. I guess the Tudor's dial is sort of more matte, and the Rolex is glossy, if you care, one way or the other. Uh, wouldn't be a big factor for me, but uh, but yeah, I guess, you know, that's one thing to keep in mind. The overall printing, uh, quality-wise, you know, it's about the same. The Rolex printing on the top, Tudor printing. A couple of interesting points about the Tudor dial more of a retro style full chapter ring, right? So you got that full circle with the graduations for the minute track, whereas on the Rolex you just have simple slash or hash mark graduations. Uh, kind of like a half train track might be another way to describe the uh, chapter ring or seconds track on the Tudor. Uh, the big point of contention for me is going to be the snowflake hands on the Tudor versus the Mercedes hands on the Rolex. I like the Mercedes hands just fine. Are they my favorite handset? Maybe not. I mean, I, mean, I like sword-style hands, I like syringe-style hands, I like pencil-style hands, but I don't, I don't not like the Mercedes hands. On the other hand, I do not like snowflake hands. I, they just don't do it for me. The square marker on the, or diamond, I guess, technically, marker on the seconds hand, and this other big giant diamond on the hour hand, it's just too much. It's overdone, in my opinion. And then again, this is just an opinion. This is, like, some people are going to love it, and some people are going to complain and cry because, like, oh, I'm just being subjective and giving my opinions. Like, look, that's what you're coming to me for. You want my opinions. You, you, you like my reviews. A review is a critique. A critique is a series of opinions. In my opinion, that snowflake hour hand sucks. <laughs> i got to be honest. I thought it would be better on the Black Bay Dive Watch. If you saw my review of the Tudor Black Bay 36 millimeter, uh, like it's just too overpowering for that watch. And I suspected or expected that the snowflake hand on the bigger dive watch would work for me. It, it doesn't. It's still too big and overpowering, kind of distracting. All right, so here's a loom shot of these two watches side by side. I'll let you be the judge of which you think is better. I like the nice blue loom on the Rolex. Uh, always have liked it, chromolite as they call it. I'm not sure which loom the Tudor uses, but nevertheless, they're both good. And uh, yeah, I'll just let you be the judge. Which do you think is better? Case backs on these watches, significantly different as it turns out. The Tudor one has a little bit of a graving or decoration on it, which is interesting, I suppose. Uh, the, the Rolex one is perfectly blank, with the exception of a little ring of polish there. The Rolex case, case back kind of bulges out, and the Tudor's is quite flat. Now, what I have learned about myself is that flat case backs and my wrist 
just don't really agree. I don't I don't know exactly why it is, but the more and more flat case back watches that I try on, the more and more I realize that I actually prefer a bit of a bulge on the case back to stand the watch up away from my wrist bone. And I think it's because I typically wear my watches very low down to the wrist. I'm super zoomed in here, so you're probably not getting a good perspective. But because I wear it so close to the wrist, um, my, my wrist bone rides underneath that case back, which causes the, the watch to jerk up on the far side of my wrist. So yeah, if you like wearing your watches lower down on the wrist, more towards your hand like I do, you might prefer the sort of bubbly backed bulging Rolex case back. At least I do. So we didn't really talk about the movements on these watches. In the Rolex, of course, we have the 3135 in the case of the Rolex Submariner date, or the 3130, if I'm not mistaken, in the non-date Submariner. Um, basically the same movements with the exception of the date complication. In this tutor we have the ETA 2824-2 and you just can't compare them, right? The, 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 the Rolex movement is so much better than most movements on the market, never mind the ETA, that it would be ridiculous to really compare them. However, we Except that there's a newer version of this Tudor Black Bay on the market that has a manufactured in-house movement, the MT5602. So if we compare apples to apples and say, let's pretend this has the new in-house movement, how then do these watches compare? Well, in some ways, the new Tudor movement is better. The 70-hour power reserve is certainly better than the 48-hour power reserve that you're going to find in the Rolex. However, being even a COSC certified chronometer, the Tudor's accuracy range is not going to be as tight because Rolex is a quote-unquote superlative chronometer. And while it is COSC certified, then it is recertified in-house at Rolex to be plus or minus two seconds per day versus the standard minus four to plus six that you would get from a simple COSC certified movement. So less power reserve, more potential accuracy... The other big difference, though, for me is that the Rolex movement has been on the market for 30 years, roughly. And the Tudor movement is since, well, I guess, technically 2016. Um, so what, two-ish years, basically? It hasn't been proven yet. And while I don't know of any problems specifically with that new in-house Tudor movement, the new movement for the GMT Black Bay that just came out at Baselworld 2018 from Tudor has had some movement, uh, some problems reported with that movement, in particular the date setting. On that watch there's a date complication, and lots of people are complaining that it's skipping dates, that it's getting stuck in between dates. So yeah, again, nobody's reported, at least in mass, problems with the in-house movement that would come in a new Tudor Black Bay diver. But the fact that the Rolex is so proven over three decades, that, that does have a lot of value, let's be honest. Final thing to compare on these watches is going to be the bracelet. And again, I want to refer to the new Tudor. The new 2016 model of the Tudor has that riveted bracelet, and I, I hate it, I'm being, if I'm being completely honest. I think that the bracelet on this older 2012 model is significantly better, and it's one of the reasons, one of several reasons why if I was going to buy a Tudor Black Bay Diver, I would go for the pre-2016 revision model like the one we have here. So let's compare these two bracelets, the non-riveted Oyster bracelet on this Tudor versus the Rolex three-piece Oyster Link bracelet. The bracelets themselves are quite similar. 22 millimeters in width on the Tudor, and I'm not a huge fan of 22 millimeter width bracelets in general, so keep that in mind, versus the 20 millimeter bracelet on the Rolex. Now the Rolex has fully extended, T-shaped, very nicely machined end links. Like there's a crisp edge right there on this T-shaped horn coming off of the end link. Whereas the Tudor has kind of the H-shaped pivoting end link not as nicely machined around these lines here and that's always something that disappoints me on end links as if it just feels like they didn't go the extra mile to 
really engineer and machine the end links, it almost comes off feeling like an afterthought. And these, these aren't bad. These aren't afterthought end links, but I don't think they're n nearly as good as the ones on the, on the Rolex. The links themselves, of course, we have screwed in links on the Tudor and obviously on the Rolex screwed in links as well. Three piece oyster style links in both cases. Very similar in terms of the feel of the quality, but the brushing, the finishing on the links of the Rolex bracelet, it's, it's nicer. The Rolex Oyster Lock Safety Latch with Glide Lock System, significantly nicer than the Tudor Clasp. Now don't get me wrong, the Tudor Clasp is nice. First of all, you do have the nice uh, engraved Tudor logo there, and they sort of incorporate the shield motif. Uh, it's kind of clever. Flip open safety latch is held in with ceramic detents. Not very positive though. It feels a little like like the lockup is mm, not tight. It doesn't feel like a bank vault. Very, very weak lockup. Do I think it would pop open accidentally? I couldn't say for sure. Probably not, but it's not the most assuring locked up feel. Once you get the folding safety latch opened, the clasp, it doesn't have a hinge or push buttons or anything. It's just kind of friction locked. That's a little bit of a letdown. It is arguably the best friction lock clasp that I have ever used. So at least there's that, but it is friction locked. nonetheless, I believe you have detents on here and then on the inside of the clasp there to hold it locked into place. The swing arm, nicely done. Stainless steel, high quality machined in a Tudor engraving. And then the clasp itself, you have three points of micro adjust, but not toolless. It's just the simple little spring bar micro adjust. That's kind of a letdown on a watch that costs $3,700 almost. The, the material, this is not the thickest, most heavy duty clasp either. It's not the cheap stamped steel that you find on two and three hundred dollar Seikos, but it's not the robust machined stainless steel that you find on the Rolex either. So overall, good bracelet, good end links, good clasp, nothing absolutely outstanding about it, but at least it doesn't have the fake or faux rivets like the newer version does. Of course, the Rolex Legendary uh, o o Oyster Lock Safety Clasp Foldover, just absolutely perfect in terms of the lockup of the safety latch. Opening up, this is hinged, it's not just a simple friction lock, and you know, that's outstanding. The swing arms, eh, basically about the same quality, high polished, nice stainless steel swing arms. But of course, the big difference being that the Rolex does have the glide lock extension so that you can adjust without the use of tools, the overall fit of, uh, of your bracelet, you know, at any time. I really think that all watches at this point should have some version of that, but you know, unfortunately we just don't see it yet. I, I don't know why. So on the, on the Rolex, outstanding, nice machined, solid end links, excellent linked bracelet, superior finishing, outstanding clasp. You know, it's not though as if, again, the Tudor's bad, but if we're comparing bracelet side by side, huge difference in terms of the overall quality and construction. How are these watches on the wrists? Well, I'll give you wrist shots of both of them, I guess. Not a huge proponent of doing wrist shots, but I know a lot of people like them. The, the Rolex up front wears much more comfortably. I'll do the Tudor first and show you what this sized watch looks like on my six and three quarter inch wrist and then I'll throw the Rolex on real quick. The Tudor Black Bay on my six and three quarter inch wrist. Yeah, it's it's big, it's bulky, it's tall. Now I had mentioned how flat case backs aren't my favorite. See how low I wear my watch to my wrist? My, my bone of my wrist is right in here. So I like to have an, a little bit of a bulge underneath the watch, holding it up above that bone, as opposed to the watch kind of resting on it. And because of that, I've realized that I don't prefer flat case-backed watches. Another problem is that there's more surface area for the watch to just stick to my skin when my skin gets warm. And I like to wear my watches loose enough to where I can just kind of shake my wrist and the watch will slide a little bit. But with all that extra surface area touching my hot 
sort of clammy, sweaty wrists when I go out into the Florida humidity. It's just harder to get it to, to move. It's like a little suction cup just sticking to me. That's another reason why I don't like big, broad, flat case backs. Something that I've just only recently discovered, but uh, but yeah, it is what it is. Uh, I probably will tend to shy away from flat case-backed watches in general as I move forward. Uh, other than that, critique of the case back and the fact that it does feel a little bit bigger than I prefer, I could wear it. It's not awful. I wore it a little bit around the house since I've had it here, and uh, yeah, it's it's doable. It's Definitely just feels a little chunky or clunky. On the other hand, the Rolex just feels way more comfortable to me. The shorter overall lug to lug means that it's not testing the edges of my wrists nearly as much. That little bit of a bulge on the case back means that it's not riding on top of my wrist bone when I wear the watch back or forward, depending on your perspective. Uh, yeah, overall, it's just a better fit on the wrist. Narrower bracelet just makes the watch feel a little bit smaller. Overall, I do. I, I prefer it quite a bit, but it is one of my favorite watches, if not my favorite watch of all time. So there's that. All right, guys, there's my presentation of the Rolex Submariner versus the Tudor Black Bay. Hope you enjoyed that. Stick with me for a few more minutes. I'm going to jump back over to the studio view and wrap this up with some of my final thoughts. So don't run off just yet. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed that comparison of the Rolex Submariner and the Tudor Black Bay. So here's the question I pose to you. If you could only pick one of these watches, which would it be? Obviously, I've already put my money where my mouth is. I own the Rolex Submariner. I love the Rolex Submariner. I think it's one of the best watches that has ever been made. Does that mean that I wouldn't own the Tudor Black Bay? Well, no, that's not exactly what it means. I have some problems with the Black Bay. I think that uh, stylistically, the Submariner is a much better package and presentation. I like the overall aesthetic much better. The Black Bay feels a little clunky and a little clumsy, and that's really where it falls short for me. I think features and specifications, there's really a whole heck of a lot to like there. However, just because I don't absolutely love the overall style and presentation doesn't mean that I don't think that it's pretty decent. I think it's good, or should I say that I don't think that it's necessarily bad. So yeah, I could see myself owning one if uh, I didn't have a Submariner, and if I couldn't afford a Submariner, I wouldn't feel bad about it whatsoever. Well, thanks again for tuning in. As always, if you'd like to help support the channel, down in the description of this and every video I do is a list of ways that you can help me out. Number one, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. That does really help. I would appreciate it greatly. Number two, if you'd like to help me and help the channel, you could always support me over on Patreon. Big thanks to the guys that have been over there helping me out. I really do appreciate that as well. Finally, my Amazon affiliate link can always be found in the description of every video that I do. If you like something that I've reviewed and you're thinking about purchasing it, or anything else for that matter, click on that affiliate link first, go over to there on Amazon and do your shopping, and I get a small commission. It doesn't cost you anything more, and it does help me out. Big thanks to everyone that's been doing that. All right, I guess that's going to wrap this up, and uh, yeah, until the next one, bye now.